Right, it is 2.15, so I am gonna get started with just some housekeeping before we get into introducing our panel. So welcome to our Field to Fork Local Food and Farm Business Panel. Um, we have uh, producers and business owners from across Humboldt, Del Norte, and Mendocino here today with us to share kind of the triumphs and challenges of uh, producing and uh, sharing food here in the North Coast region. Um, so just for using Hopin, um, Please introduce yourself in the chat if you would like, and just make sure that you're in the session chat versus the event. So along the top right-hand side, there's sort of tabs. Um, so make sure you're in the session tab all the way, the top to the right. And then um, if you have comments, um, put those in the chat. If you have questions for our panelists, please put those in the Q&A. And we do have a couple fun polls that are up if you wanna participate in those. If you wanna see who's here, you can click on people. Um, let's see. Another quick hop and tip is in the bottom right hand side there's sort of that open square um if you hit that we'll go to full screen um and you'll be able to see everyone and the presentation a lot larger um the session organizers today are myself andrea langto i'm the food program coordinator from the del norte and tribal lands community food council um, may patino from the humboldt food policy council and ivy north from north coast growers association so um thank you everyone for joining us today and uh may patino is going to introduce our panelists Okay, yeah, thank you, Drea. Um, so we have um, we have six panels here today. We're really excited. We have Rachel Britton of Mendocino Grain Project, um, Carolyn Radis for Black Dog Farm and Catering, Joby Romiano of Romiano Cheese, uh, Christine Silver of, of multiple locations, Delish on Fifth, Sixth and E Eatery, um, and the Humboldt Soup Company, um, and Ashley Vellis of Ashley Seafood, and Rhonda Weidenbeck of Beck's Bakery. So huge thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, just for some general framing for everyone, um, this goal of the session is to both highlight um, local producers in the Tri-County area that are providing sustainable local food um, in innovative ways, um, and also to hear about what some of the opportunities are for supporting and increasing um, the resilience of the regional food system through the types of, of work that you're doing. So we hope that everybody is able to leave the session today with an increased understanding of some of the work that you do and hopefully some ideas and tips that relate to your work um, in your life as well. So today we have set aside about 30 minutes for the panel's questions. Um, these are questions that the panel has had a chance to, to look at and mull over a little bit ahead of time. Um, and then we're gonna open things up for about 15 minutes for the audience to have some Q and A and discussion afterwards. Um, but before we dive into the questions, um, we would like each of the panelists to have an opportunity to introduce yourselves a little bit. Um, so each of you will have about two to three minutes um, to share about things like how did you get your business started? Um, how long have you been in business um, in this region? And how has your business changed over the years? Um, where, you know, what's your market base? Why is that your market base? Um, and, and how do you engage with the community? These are just some of the prompts that we gave the panelists to kind of guide their introductions. So you're each gonna answer them to, to the best what makes sense um, for the work that you do. So I'll go ahead and we'll just go in alphabetical order um, and each of you will have a chance to introduce yourselves um, to the group today before we do the Q&A. So without further ado, um, see Rachel Britton of Mendocino Grain Project. Are you here, Rachel? You no, know, I saw Rachel a moment ago. Yes, All right, right, we might go out of order. <laughs> Well, we wait for Rachel to get back. Um, Caroline, um, would you be okay with introducing yourself first? I'd love to. Um, my name's Caroline Radice. I'm the owner of Black Dog Farm and Catering. I moved here from San Francisco where I was looking, working as a line cook back in 2003. 
um, I came up here for work as a private, I got a private chef job on a cannabis farm during harvest, back when it was not cool to say that you were working on a cannabis farm during harvest, but that is what brought me to Mendocino County. Um, and I ended up decide, deciding it was beautiful and I wanted to stay here. Um, so I worked as a diversified vegetable farmer for several years and then eventually got tired of trying to explain to people how to cook kale, trying to get them to buy it at the farmer's market and said, I'm, I'm just going to cook it for you. I know if I make it, you're going to like it. Um, and so I really uh, brought back my cooking experience and started offering uh, catering and private chef services. Um, I've been cooking my whole life and gardening my whole life. Um, so it always was kind of a natural fit and uh, I love doing both things. Um, and so th that's my business in a nutshell. Great, thank you, Caroline. And I apologize, I've been pronouncing your name incorrectly for <laughs> that that's <year>. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I already learned something new today. <laughs> um, let's see, next up we have Joby. Hello, I'm Joe B. Rumiano, um, fourth generation cheese owner here in Crescent City, California at Rumiano Cheese, which was started by um, three Italian immigrant brothers in 1919 in Willows, California. We originally had eight cheese plants up and down the uh, California and Oregon uh, coast, and um, we consolidated um, in the 40s and 50s. Um, and kept the facility here in uh, Crescent City due to the milk in Humboldt and Del Norte counties because it's the best milk in the world. And um, we have a cut and wrap facility down in Willows. We just built a new plant um, this last year, which is just starting to open and run. Um, we've been in business here again since the 40s. Um, I think refrigeration and transportation um, allowed us to consolidate um, longer shelf life of products and which meant, you know, more availability uh, to a larger customer base. Um, our, our primary market is from the Bay Area to the Oregon Washington border and west of the Rockies. And um, we purchased milk here from uh, I think we've got 27 local family farms in Humboldt and Del Norte County that we buy milk from right now. Um, we're about 87% um, organic at this point. Um, so we've been transitioning to 100% orga organic since 2003. So we've been doing it a long time. Um, I call this whole area here our local agri ecosystem because um, we all relate with each other and we all contribute to the economy more than people even know. Um, so you can buy our products here at our little store and then we also can be found in uh, retail stores throughout the United States and the big chains such as Costco and uh, Whole Foods and Sprouts and those stores too. So thanks. Muted. <laughs> you missed all of that, didn't you? Thank you so much for that. Thank you for being here. Um, next, we have Christine Silver. Hi, everybody. Christine Silver. Um, I'm an executive chef and restaurateur. Yes, I'm also a crazy woman who owns four restaurants here in Eureka. Um, been here now after lusting for the area and wanting to come here for the better part of the last 20 years. I've been here about eight um, years. And I think one of the biggest draws as a chef was our agricultural community here, being able to have access to all of just the amazing products, primarily the vegetables. You know, we don't get as much access to livestock and things um, because of the restrictions that there are on that. But for me as a chef, um, food and nutrition kind of go hand in hand. Um, I often say I'm not hungry. I need nourishment. Um, and nourishment begins with the quality of the ingredients and those quality of the ingredients begin with you know let's say uh the rumiano cheese that you know really have a passion for where the baseline of their ingredients come from turn it into a product that goes out into the community and that's kind of me as well now i have a few restaurants you know uh 
you know, uh, sixth and E is a burger joint. So, you know, there's not as much health and nutrition that goes into that. That's your comfort food. But primarily with the Humboldt Soup Company, um, in season, I can purchase up to a thousand pounds a week of produce. We do things like um, uh, it, when tomatoes are in season, we'll buy, well, not this year because tomatoes weren't great for farmers and not last year because the last year didn't count. Um, but prior to that, we would buy over a six week period about 4,000 pounds of tomatoes and roast them and skin them and then put them in our freezers. So that's just one example of things that we do with produce to extend the season and extending the season is not only good for us, it's good for my customers because I know I'm giving them good nutrition, but it's good for the farmers too. So I've been developing relationships with our local agricultural community all of this time. And it's funny because they always look at you like, oh, there's another one. Um, but now they know um, I'm a serious and big buyer and I almost never say no to a farmer. Um, my chefs in the restaurants aren't real happy about that because we just sometimes have way too much produce coming in the back door, uh, but I just can't say no. So. I love it here. I do what I do um, uh, because of the community and a uh, large part because of the food community here. And so um, I continue to uh, invest my time and I'm really happy to participate and thankful that you guys include me in these things um, because it is uh, very important. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for being here. Quick question. Is my voice clear to everyone or is it breaking up? It's fine. Okay. My computer started kind of flat. A little bit there for a second, so I thought maybe no, it is breaking listening. up, May. So if you want, I could I could take over. Um, you are breaking up. So uh, next up is Ashley Vellis. Hello, <laughs> uh, my name is Ashley Vellis. I'm from McKinleyville, California. Um, here in Humboldt, <laughs> uh, I'm the owner of Ashley Seafood, a local business. Uh, that brings locally sourced wild caught seafood to Humboldt County. Um, we distribute throughout the community through our local farmers markets, local grocery stores and restaurants, and at our retail location here in McKinleyville. Uh, my husband operates our commercial fishing vessel, the Sandy B, um, which provides us with much of what we sell. We work with anywhere between five to 20 local captains to provide consistency and variety for our community. Um, and we specialize in most all things local um in from the ocean uh through sustainable methods of fishing um expressing complete visibility to our customers uh such as who caught your fish where when and what fishing methods were used um, we started our seafood journey um back in 2013 when my husband was a deckhand um for uh let's see for uh out in trinidad and uh it wasn't until 2019 when we purchased our boat that we decided to take the plunge and start selling seafood. Um, we noticed that there wasn't anybody selling locally seafood. A lot of everything is distributed outside of the area and things weren't staying local. Um, and it was the number one question uh, where, when people come to town is, where can I get something local? Um, and it was really hard to to tell people you can't. <laughs> so, um, so I'm really excited to be here and uh, yeah, talk about that. <laughs> Great, thank you, Ashley. And I'm assuming everyone can hear me again. Okay, all right, sorry about that. <laughs> um, and let's see, next we have Rhonda and it does look like Rachel is here. So Rachel, you'll go after Rhonda. Hi, I'm Rhonda Wiedenbeck from Beck's Bakery. Um, the bakery's located in Arcata, and we've been in business for about nine years. I have um, been think I thought about it for like five years prior to opening the bakery um, and trying to figure out how to do do that. Um, I opened the bakery because I was looking for more grainy or seedy or bread than I was um, able to find locally. Um, we have a great bread culture in um, the Humboldt County region, you know, the Eureka, Arcata, McKinleyville, Fortuna region. And, um, and so I knew that it was going to be a tough haul to, to break into that. So I uh, took classes through the San Francisco Baking Institute and just really um, tried to hone and learn my skill set there. Um, we are primarily a... Um, 
bread cracker granola bakery. We sell um, most of our business is wholesale. So we're selling to grocery stores and food service. And then we also do have a direct sale component where we're at farmers markets. And um, just this last year, we started um, in Ernst, our curbside direct sell um, online um, business. Um, our primary um, uh, market is uh, folks who are um, interested in eating healthy foods and um, and uh, interested in local food sovereignty issues um, because we are buying grains directly from farmers, milling them fresh in our bakery. And we put grain, local grain in everything that we make anywhere from 5% to 100% whole grain. Um, and so there's kind of a little bit of confusion that every, that people think that all of our grain is whole, is local grain, but it's not, it's just the whole grains that are local. Um, the ways that we engage with our community, you know, we, we are, we've been at the farmer's market for about eight years. Uh, we teach baking classes and um, offer free starter to folks who um, come by and ask for it. Um, we also partner with uh, um, Humboldt State University and, and um, our, we greatly appreciate access to interns who help us with um, different business issues going on or, or just helping us explore business um, opportunities. Um, and then, you know, we, we definitely are purchasing professional services locally. We get our, um, our labels are made by Bug Press. We um, try to purchase produce and um, items that we can put in, in turn, put into our products locally and um, graphic artwork and bookkeepers and all that kind of stuff there. But um, yeah, there's a, you, it's been great being in the business, um, in this business climate, because people really do love um, having access to this kind of fresh food. And so, um, so that's really sweet. That's all I have. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Mm -hmm. And Rachel, I'm so glad that you were able to, to make it in here. Sorry about the, the technical delay. I think you're muted still. Yeah. The um, lower middle. There. Can everybody hear me? Good. I'm experiencing the adventures of rural broadband, but kind of excitedly um, working with students at the Santa Rosa Junior College today. So that's why I'm out of my own territory. Um, so it's super fun for me to go after Rhonda <laughs> because I feel like she's um, part of a group of people that really laid the groundwork for what I do. So I feel like uh, I get to build on her legacy and so it feels appropriate to introduce myself right after her. So um, we run a business in Mendocino County. Um, we really work regionally with farmers and we do three things. We farm, so we grow wheat and grains. Um, like we also grow lentils and rye, and then some ancient grains like einkorn. And we also then something that's really important to us is lowering barriers to entry for other grain farmers in the region. And so the way that we do that is we offer custom harvesting services. So we come in and harvest. So if a farmer were to plant grain, which most hay farmers, for example, have the equipment that they need to work a field and plant grain, but they don't have the harvesting equipment. And so that's something we're able to do for them. And then post harvest, there's another processing step that grain has to go through. It's not ready to be food yet. And so that's a pretty equipment intensive process. And so that's equipment that we have and we run a seed, um, seed cleaning facility out of Mendocino County. So we're able to clean our own products and um, we're able to clean products for other farmers as well. One thing that's really exciting about that is last year we started working with Blake Richards, who is a quinoa farmer in Humboldt County. And originally we were just supporting his distribution, but this year um, he did a little bit of his processing himself and then was able to hand off the quinoa to us. And we've um, kind of upgraded our processing to be able to handle quinoa as well. And so we're kind of bringing, bringing those steps of food distribution and processing home. So that's really exciting. There's 20,000 pounds of quinoa sitting in my warehouse right now that's um, getting cleaned 
uh, last week and this week. So that's an exciting step for us. And then the final thing we do is mill flour and then we package products and we sell. So we sell both wholesale and we sell retail as well. So uh, like many small businesses, we probably do too many things, but we love them all. <laughs> and yeah, I think my vision is really, um, you know, I feel really thankful for the amazing local products that are available. And I feel like I feel like my piece of it is providing local staple crops. And I think that's a really important part of local food security and sovereignty and um because they're storable and they're, you know, there's a lot of calories in a pound of lentils in a good way. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, my vision is just to continue diversifying the crops that we offer and to continue to support other farmers so that we can offer crops beyond just what we can grow um, on our acreage. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. So that's that's the introduction section. So next we're going to go into the the first set of questions. Um, Andrea, I think you were going to ask the first one of the group. Yeah, this is really exciting to have so many different businesses here. So I think we're going to get a great diversity of responses. Um, so the first question um, we pose to the panel today is how has your business or organization pivoted or adapted in recent years in response to the impacts of COVID, climate change, and our changing economy? And what changes have you made that you will hold on to? So we'll go in the same order if that makes sense. So we'll start with you, Caroline. Thanks. Um, I have a lot of answers for this question. Uh, the first one goes back a couple years, back to 2015, but um, I think it ties in with the changing economy where um, the experience that I was having working as a diversified vegetable farmer doing annual produce for farmers markets uh, kind of inspired me to be a co-founder of a project that I really love, the Good Farm Fund, um, which some of you may have heard of, um, but it's in Mendocino and Lake Counties, and we're a fiscally sponsored project of North Coast Opportunities now, <laughs> and we have multiple programs, and Rachel, are you laughing? <laughs> I, was, I was just being supportive. <laughs> okay. We're a fiscally sponsored project of North Coast Opportunities, which is the community action agency here. Um, and we've given out several hundred thousand dollars now of community fundraised money in capacity building grants for small food producers in Mendocino and Lake County. Um, and so it's about grassroots, grassroots fundraising to help farmers invest in their businesses, because what I really was experiencing myself and then I was also seeing all of my friends and peers experience is that the cost of living in our area is high enough and the profit margins on food businesses tend to be low enough that investing in your business to help it grow and be a viable thriving business was often challenging unless you had some kind of outside subsidy. So the intention was to create a program that would, um, be kind of like a universal subsidy for any farmer that could apply and qualify for it in our area. Um, so right now it's in Mendocino and Lake County, and we hope to create a model that we could um, that we could share with other counties too. Um, so that's that's like the biggest thing that I've done. Um, but I would say I have some more recent changes because of COVID, where. Um, because of COVID and climate change with having major wildfires every year, I actually have slowed down our like work schedule and the amount of work I try and do every year and our staff does every year. So um, instead of planning for a busy year, I plan that there's gonna be some kind of major disaster at this point. Um, and then I also do financial planning for like worst case scenario. Um, I had a couple years where I was actually the program manager for our food hub in Mendocino County also, and I started doing our financial plan that we should be, we should be doing our projections based on having to like close for multiple weeks in peak summer during fire season, because that was what we were actually experiencing, that we would actually have to close down for some reason or another, um, so basically going into our year with like dire projections 
that were very conservative um, seems to be a, a good approach for financial planning at this point. That's my answer. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to hear more about the Good Farm Fund and how we can bring that up to Humboldt and Del Norte. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, uh, Joby? All right, so this is the second question on here, right? About the COVID stuff, how we, okay. All right, um, our business has excelled uh, actually during the whole pandemic um, because we are making food. Um, I think everybody that um, is here local and um, making a product that is wholesome and you know consumable and good for you and all that, um, has done well um and one of those main reasons is uh we were vertically integrated so we were able to get product to our um, customers um, where a lot of the freight issues that affected many of the other larger um, businesses um, we were able to use our own trucks and get product up and down all around um, into the stores and so that allowed us to be on the shelf when there wasn't anything on the shelf. So now it's our um, challenge to stay on the shelf. So we've had to kind of expand our growth, you know, with our um, demand. Um, so we've been making a lot of cheese and protein and butter and lactose during this whole time. Um, and honestly, the labor shortage has been a huge impact. Um, uh, I was coming in and working with the, some of the guys on the butter side at like three in the morning. And it, it was, we looked around and it was the same crew that was here in 1995. So and I was like, I mean, it's a good core group of people, you know, but there is this big gap with different generations that are coming into the workforce. And so that's really the challenge. Um, we also have, uh, land issues here. Um, there isn't a lot of land available. A lot of it's owned by the state and uh, um, the feds in Del Norte County. Um, also, there's a lot of restrictions um, for doing uh, grazing and, and that sort of thing. So a lot of it's uh, dune habitat or, you know, they've got wetland habitats, things like that, where it's protected as well, or um, coastal commission zones things like that, regulations. Um, uh, here locally in the city, we have uh, the wastewater issue as does probably every single county in the north um, where there's issues with effluent and being able to treat effluent. We put in our own wastewater treatment facility. It's all microbiological, all this neat stuff, reverse osmosis, lots of things for sustainability that we just have been doing for my whole life and even my grandfather um, was doing this early early on um, and um, yeah I guess the um, other challenge for us is the shipping um, I think every one of us here that makes a product and tries to sell it online or um, using our carriers uh, in a remote rural area is is expensive it's unreliable and uh, the customers aren't really happy when their product isn't arriving when it says it's going to arrive. So I think, you know, for me, it's uh, those are really like the everyday concerns. Um, so we worked on that and, and, you know, trying to get trained skillful labor um, into the workforce via internships or um, working with universities or schools or, um, training programs, vocational programs, things like that is kind of where I'm at and, and what I'm trying to help here locally. So that's it for me. Thank you. I look forward to talking to you more about how can help support getting some youth trained up for our food system work. Um, next is Christine. Hey there. So yeah, in the last couple of years, um, I guess let's talk about the last uh, year and a half. And let's hope we all can stop saying the C word pretty soon. Um, but it was kind of bittersweet for me because what happened, just speaking directly about working with our local farmers, 
is, of course, you know, we all got scared a little bit at the beginning of all of this, right? So just about every business kind of either had to halt or scale back or by choice or or by, you know, just the, the nature of what happened. And, you know, I think the farmers felt that too. And the other thing is, which was really great, and that's a bittersweet part, is locally people started really understanding how important our local agriculture was. So there was a huge demand on local produce. So there was a large demand on local produce. The farmers were selling just about everything they could at the farmer's market. And so me wanting to come in and say, can I buy everything on your table today? No, they, you know, they could sell as much as they wanted to directly to the consumer. So that actually affected my business in a negative way because there was quite some time when I just last year during the season that I just didn't have a lot of local produce in the restaurant, just the minimal amount. So that was, you know, bittersweet. It was disappointing for me. Um, but, you know, I was very happy to see people being aware and more so supporting the local agricultural community. Um, yeah, all the things that uh, Joby mentioned um, in regards to the challenges of doing business. And, and uh, you know, we'll just we'll just see where we all go moving forward, you know, with the workforce. It's um, interesting, interesting times. Yes. And Caroline as well. Yeah. How do, how do you plan moving forward? And I'm just a gal who doesn't know any better, but to just push and do the best and grow as most most that I can. So, you know, but we do all have to have that what if scenario in the back of our mind. What's next? That's what I say. What's next? Power outages, pandemics. I don't know what's next, um, but just keep moving forward. So that's all I have. Thank you, Christine. Um, Ashley. Um, how our business has pivoted um, and changed in COVID. Um, so as I said before, we're pretty new established business in 2019. So when COVID uh, came in, we just moved into Captain's Ice Crab House and we're running this full-blown um, pre-existing business. Um, it got really busy for us in our seafood industry, I feel like. Um, it was kind of conflicting. Um, we as harvesters were finding ourselves with consumers who were wanting to purchase the product and our main main suppliers were having to shut their facilities down because their employees were getting COVID. Um, uh, Newport is a great example. Um, most of the people there work for one of our larger chain supply uh, seafood distributors in the nation and uh, their whole town practically had to shut down because of it. Um, meanwhile, you have fishermen that have families that are needing to be supported and rent due. And um, uh, so there was this huge need for small scale fish buyers. Um, so I started moving more product. Um, we started opening the shop um, up to seven days a week and doing four to four to five different farmers markets uh, a week. Um, and it, it got pretty busy for me. Um, Let's see, back to the question. Um, one of the things that we have um, really play a huge part in us uh, on top of um, on top of a global pandemic is uh, restrictions and seasons and weather. So um, there's a lot of um, a lot of that that we were kind of negotiating or navigating, um, especially with our 2021 season. Um, it was just a really low volume year for Dungeness Crab, which is our primary, um, we are primarily a Dungeness Crab port, um, primarily a Dungeness Crab northern region. Um, so that was a huge, huge um, uh, impact for us in our industry. Um, and so we found ourselves having to pull more from different fisheries. Um, so uh, that was really great because a lot of our fishermen were going out and looking for fish that they would not have normally caught uh, during an open access permit. Um, and so they were keeping us filled with not only crab, um, but seafood, so or fish. Um, so we got creative with that and trying to make things last longer um, by using as much byproduct as we possibly could. Um, by shaving off backbones, uh, using crab shells for stock, um, and even everything to even, you know, 
dog food. <laughs> so we were getting more creative um, with uh, the things that we had to deal with. Um, yeah, I think that that's um, changes that I've made. Um, uh, let's see, I think one of the things that we have changed um, I think that's about it, guys. <laughs> that's great. Um, uh, Rhonda, thank you, Ashley. All righty. So, um, you know, I, I think um, every year something different and new is happening and we're, you know, constantly having to pivot. Um, the, we, Weather has always been something of concern for me, you know, getting the farmer's report saying, you know, rains are late, we um, we planted the grain and it didn't rain and so the grain isn't coming up or the rains haven't let up and we can't plant the grain yet and our growing season is gonna be too short. And then, um, and then we everything goes great in the spring and they get it planted and then it stops raining, you know, it sprouts and then it stops raining. And so that's what happened this year was, um, you know, the, the grain sprouted and started growing, but then it stopped raining. And so my my main farmer, who's John Laboito, he grows out in Lake County. He was just like, you know, I don't know if we're going to even get anything out of these fields of um, of the hard red wheat called Hollis. And that's our that's the backbone of our whole grain program at the bakery. And so, um, so that's when I went down to Mendocino and I met Rachel <laughs> because uh, Rachel at the Mendocino Grain Project uh, works with a lot of different farmers. And it was just like, Rachel, if this happens, can I get grain from you? And she was like, oh yeah, come on, come on down. We'll, we'll set you up. So, um, so, you know, having, there aren't a lot of grain farmers in Humboldt County. There's actually, um, I th that I know of um, that are growing the, the, the traditional bread making grains um, of rye and wheat are, um, are the Heinleys in the Matol Valley. And then, um, gosh, I can't remember their names. There's um, some folks who are experimentally, this is their first year growing grain in the, in the bottoms. Um, and, um, and it's just not a necessarily a great region for growing grains up here. And then just throw crazy weather stuff on top of it. It just really makes it um, makes it kind of nutty. So I'm always thinking about, you know, um, and, and I've had this this discussion, too, with the North Coast Growers Association about like getting local products in and buying grain local. It's like I'll buy it if it's here, but we aren't guaranteed that it's going to grow. Um, and that we're going to be able to purchase it here. So when, um, so the the good story that happened with John Laboito, my farmer growing in Lake County, was he happened to have planted a drought tolerant variety, and it kicked butt. He's like it was the most glorious, beautiful grain he'd ever seen. And up until like two months before harvest, he was convinced that we weren't going to get anything out of it. And he's like, this is amazing. So we have that kind of a um, feast or famine kind of, um, experience with that. And boy, I've never been, uh, I've never paid so much attention to seasonal weather like I have in the nine years that I've had this business and, and was buying from farmers um, there. And, um, you know, with the, with the COVID situation, we had, um, we're half of, more than half of our business is linked to restaurants and, um, and grocery stores. And so when COVID hit and the restaurants closed, we lost a significant portion of our business um, because we were, we, were work, we were selling bread to restaurants. So um, we had started to do some online sales, but it was just kind of dabbling and didn't quite know how to do it. But I quickly figured out, okay, we gotta, we gotta punch this up and make it work. And, um, and then we didn't do farmer's market for a whole year, for a whole season. Um, we we um, stayed out away from that. So we did curbside and we're still doing curbside. We have a significant amount of business now coming from our curbside um, um, sales. We have a, a website um, 
that we set up and so people can order. I send out a weekly letter called the bread letter announcing what our whole grain bread of the week is going to be because we have a rotating cycle of whole grains that um, breads that we're making. And, um, and people can get all the ingredient info, they get all the sourcing info, and sometimes I might write about what's going on at the bakery or what's on my mind or something. Usually I don't have time and I'm and I'm just rushing to get it get it out so I don't do too much creative writing, thank goodness for them. Um, uh, so so that's been um, that's been an interesting thing. But we did have to scale back, you know, because our, our bake staff just wasn't comfortable working you know, together before vaccinations um, and, and just were really concerned about um, COVID flaring up in the bakery. We were very fortunate that it didn't happen um, in the bakery, but, um, but uh, we, and we kind of have kept a lot of the scaling back. You know, we were baking five days a week and we're um, pretty much baking two to three times a week now. So we, we haven't bounced back yet. Um, and then the um, the the other um, thing that we'd started to really uh, work on some more was partnerships with CSAs, and um, um, they're putting on an, a bread share in, along with their um, with their vegetable share. And some of them are even getting more creative about coffee shares and mushroom shares and bean shares. And so we're part of that share program, which has been really sweet. And then we've also started to do a bread subscription through the bakery um, that people can um, sign up for an eight week bread subscription um, and, and get a different whole grain bread each week. So um, yeah, you know, I've been really thankful that, you, you know, we had the PPP money come through because it definitely made it so we um, are coming out the other end. We certainly use that there. And I know we're kind of the anomaly in the food kind of business where our business actually dropped, but we we tried to hustle and figure out other ways to make it work. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, before we transition, I just want to make a comment. We have lots of questions that we might not get to. So I'm, I might start putting a couple in the chat and while people, some of the panelists are maybe waiting for their turn. I don't, I don't want, I want you to be able to listen, but maybe if you want to answer some of the questions in the chat, we can get to a little bit more. So uh, Christine. I'm sorry, I was typing a message to Rhonda. Was there a question? Rhonda, I want your bread back. Um. <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, the question was, how has your business pivoted or adapted in recent years in, resp in response to the impact of COVID, climate change, and our changing economy? And what yeah, changes have you made that you'll hold on to? Yeah, I did respond to that in, in regards to, you know, just dealing with local farmers, um, you know, and just to elaborate on it um again i'm all about growth and pushing growth and i'm i'm just a um, hopeless optimist when it comes to that things and, and a hopeless optimist when it comes to the eureka and humboldt county and um moving forward um you know i don't know i think that throughout all of this there was a lot that i went through owning as many restaurants that i do and um but what the message I kept reminding myself was just stay on course, stay on course, stay on course. Because when it first hit, Rhonda remembers, I tried to do a little local delivery thing and I got all of the, I got Rhonda's bread and I got a bunch of farmers and a bunch of things and I brought them into the store and I thought everybody's going to be so excited about it, but nobody knew me to do that before. So why were they looking for me to do it now? So it was a big investment that I lost some money on and uh, learned, learned a lesson there. So, you know, um, what I have learned is um, I've been doing what I do for the better part of 30 years, and um, I just will continue to stay on course. And if outside factors uh, want to try to take me down and they succeed, then I've done the best that I can with what I do. Thank you. And I do apologize that we had that we had talked to you. So, Rachel. I've, I've here. Talked lot, so, yeah, give you a chance. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I'm glad that happened. That was a good bit of wisdom there, Christine. <laughs> um, yeah, again, it's, I'm like really enjoying, I basically feel like I should be sitting with you, Rhonda. <laughs> um, 
because yeah, I mean, definitely everything you said, of course, as farmers and specifically as dry farmers, so we don't use irrigation infrastructure, um, much like fishing, it sounds like Ashley, you know, it's like we're on the front line of, of climate change and the impact of climate change. And, you know, it's like, what do we do? I think, I think for me, it feels like the only answer is diversity, right? And I think clearly that comes through for all of us in marketing strategies. And I think that applies to farming strategies also. So for example, we, we've always planted our grain in the spring and this year, um, just before this rain, we put in 20 acres of fall planted grain, which is the first for us. Um, but it means that, um, but it means that we know that grain will get rain. Um, it will also probably get a lot of weed growth. So <laughs> those are the trade-offs. Um, yeah. And so I didn't mention this earlier, but the Mendocino Grain Project was started in 2009 by a man named Doug Mosel, who um, is an incredible, passionate mentor and promoter of the local grain movement. And uh, so I acquired, I our literal acquisition date was February of 2020. <laughs> and so I've basically only known this business in COVID, which as it turns out was a great time to get into the flower business. <laughs> so, um, so that was kind of interesting. I thought I was gonna have a lot of marketing work to do. And instead I was just hustling to, um, keep product available and mill fast enough. You know, I quickly felt like we outgrew our infrastructure. And then, of course, I think like we've heard from other panelists, now the question is, okay, you know, there was this great surge, like are people going to keep baking sourdough like they did during COVID? Um, I think we've definitely seen some drop off from those sales, but I, I think we've also seen some long term converts to um, the deliciousness of freshly milled grain and also just the yeah, the meditative practice of, of home baking. So yeah, I think at the end of the day for us, both in our farming practices and in our business practices, just, you know, for example, like being able to offer quinoa um, and I would like to do more, like definitely a grain that we're looking at is sorghum and millet um, grains that maybe aren't as common, but that can diversify what we're offering so that we're sure that we always have some thing available um, for the current context and climate that we're in. So I, I think diversifying our, our farming strategies, but also the actual crops that we're growing. And I just want to say we're a recipient of a Good Farm Fund grant. It was extremely helpful. <laughs> it's one of the reasons we were able to take on the quinoa processing because we were able to um, upgrade a lot of our, basically the kind of system in our warehouse and those kind of direct grants were like, it made all the difference for us. And I think that it's a great program. Wonderful, thank you all for that. Um, just being conscious of, of the timing, um, I'm thinking that we'll do things a little bit out of order and that if there's some questions from the audience, um, that anyone wants to, to ask at this time, this would be a great time to do them and we can kind of bounce back and forth depending on how many audience questions there are. We certainly have many more questions um, prepared. So if there, if there aren't audience questions, we'll jump back into those. But I wanted to make sure we did have a moment to check in with everybody that's here um, to have a chance to ask some things. I also wanted to make sure that the panelists did see that um, Drea posted one of the next, the ex next question that we had up in the, in the chat box as well and any of you are, are welcome to respond to that um, if, if one of the other panelists is, is, is responding to a different question. So here's a question that's come up um, from William. Has anyone dealt with city code regarding farming on low density residential land? Is there anyone that would like to speak to that? Uh, I could just jump in briefly and say that I know that the city of Eureka has done a lot of work on their general plan to make it uh, more possible for people to be farming within Eureka city limits. So if anybody is in Eureka um, and has that question, I recommend uh, reaching out to the city or going onto their website and looking into the general plan um, and see if in fact it does allow for uh, the project that you may be looking to do. Great, thank you, Ivy. 
And let's see next up. Um, Greg has asked, what is the top one or two things that we in economic development or government can do to help expand the industry? I'd be interested in, in, in taking a stab at that one. Um, and I'm trying to be aware of time. So speaking as a Good Farm Fund organizer, um, every year we offer a farm grant cycle and it's we fundraise through a various set of, we have a lot of different fundraising channels for it. Last year though, Mendocino County had gotten um, CARES funding, which was COVID relief funding and was able to earmark $100,000 of it directly for farm grants. So we originally wouldn't have been able to offer as many farm grants last year. And instead the county, it, it was the first time ever that we had county money go, county or federal money go directly to small farms in the area. And um, I wish I had more time to really talk about the difference that a couple thousand dollars can make in a farm's budget for the year but the stories from all of the grants that went out are just so impactful. Um, and so after it happened, I was like, I wanna spend all of my advocacy time trying to encourage governments to just earmark some funding to go in the form of direct subsidies to small food and farm businesses um, where that business can spend it however that business needs to be spending it that year even if it's like only a few thousand dollars, I think that all food businesses are in a pretty, all food businesses need support right now. Um, no matter what kind it is, <laughs> no, like no matter what type of business and then no matter what type of support, we all need a lot of support if we're gonna stay in business and um, seeing direct support from the government uh, to keep these businesses here is um, I think one of the most meaningful things that could happen. I want to clarify also the grants are true grants. It's not a loan program. A lot of people like to say, well, we could offer loans. It's not a lending program. It is a grant program where you get the money, you have to do the project, but you never give the money back. And there's no expectation that you're going to give the money back because that money, um, it's, it's giving back to the community in the form of food and like community and farmers markets and restaurants. Um, so that's how it's going back to jobs. I mean, these grants I to speak. jobs. Okay. I wanted, to that's speak to, I wanted to speak to Greg's question as well. Um, you know, what, what can the support be done? A couple things, you know, last year when all of this was happening and, and working with the local farmers and the growers association and all of that, um, you know, there was, and I, I know it's a, a, a topic or concept that's been proposed in the past. I know that Caroline has some experience on this, good and bad, um, uh, in regards to a local food hub. And I remember talking to the farmers last year and, you know, the majority of them telling me, you know, as, as, as the news is talking about food scarcity, food scarcity, most of our farmers were saying, we can handle this county. We, we most of the farmers only plant to a certain percentage most of the ranchers only uh, uh, raise their their um, you know chickens or cows to a certain percentage because you know you you can't overproduce right and so the more that we can support local agriculture in every way then it gives those businesses those farming and agricultural businesses um the 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 guarantee that they can sell what they produce of course they've got the same problems that we do you know they can plant as much as they want but if they don't have anybody to work in the fields to get that stuff to market there's another challenge there but in working with the food hub one of the things that you know i mean as much local produce that i buy i also have trucks i have a produce truck that delivers to my restaurants twice a week and you know there's just a major major opportunity and it's challenging for sure. And from a chef and restaurant tour, you know, I put the effort and I love it. I love, I love working Saturdays and going to the farmer's market. It's my favorite day of the week. Um, but to put the time and effort into trying to procure those is, is really difficult. And I think that's the biggest obstacle for restaurants. So something like a food hub um, would be something that would make the access accessibility to all of that much better. So 
you know, I know that's an ongoing project at Maine. I think Ivy's involved in as well. And um, I dropped off of it for a bit, but I'm super hopeful that something like that will will do. And just any and everything that we can do to continue to support our agricultural community. Um, Greg, anything. Thanks. Bye. No, thank you, Christine. Um, is there anybody else that had another element that they wanted to add to that before I comb through the, the chat box again? That was a great question. Um, let's see. I'll, I'll talk for a second. Anybody have okay. An great. Um, one thing we've been talking about with uh, HSU and stuff with um, with the Cal Polytechnic um, grant and stuff that they're getting. Um, was to um, focus on the dairy science a little bit and also just food science in general. Um, I believe that there's opportunity, as I'm sure all of you do as well, with the stuff that's grown here um, and it being scientifically proven to be, you know, healthier or have more nutrition or, you know, things like that, that needs to have some science backing um, to make a claim. And um, I, I also believe that we can have a regional focused uh, certification by doing that, that is, you know, North Coast focused or whatever. Um, something like that, that allows us to differentiate um, our products from, from the mainstream commodity, uh, basically copy everything that we're doing, but they're really not doing the same thing. So um, I think, you know, it has to be done through uh, the science, the programs to be able to make the claims. Um, just let's say organic is mainstream. Uh, so we need to focus on, you know, the specific attributes that are um, unique to this region. Um, which we have water, we have green grass, we have healthy lifestyle, we have, you know, all these things, clean air, um, all these important aspects that people you know would love to have and so it goes into all of our products whether we're growing things um, making things and then we're, we have a passionate a group of people um, that are doing all these things right making the products um, catching the products doing the things um, so that's that's generally how I see our opportunities um, and then bringing up the next generations and and having you know, some, some people to follow us, um, to help us, you know, into the future. I think that's important. And then to support each other. Like, um, I know we're doing a, a program now where we're doing, um, trying to bring a whole bunch of different products. I, I think someone mentioned earlier that there was a, like the restaurant business, it, it, it had a big dip, right? Initially during the um, pandemic. And so what we did, I was getting phone calls from cheese, People all over artisanal these people that I know, and they're trying to figure out a way. So we, we came up with this program where we're, we're doing a board at home, which is a, a group effort where we're bringing in artisanal cheese from all over the the state, and adding like uh, bags uh, crackers in there and things like that. So we're trying to you know support each other and help other people out with our vertical integration our distribution cut and wrap all the stuff that we can do and um you know i think those kind of things are really important um to keep our agro ecosystem rolling so i share that yeah thank you for that um and i I was having some technical difficulties, um, so I had to jump off in the middle of it. But from some of the pieces that I was catching, um, I would definitely love to follow up with you some more about your 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 thoughts about uh, programming at HSU. As an aside, because we're definitely um, there are some things in the works um, that kind of started into play before the Polytechnic, and, and now there's probably some more opportunity. No guarantees, but definitely um, something that there's another piece to put out there in terms of thinking about um, our region and the different opportunities that we could start kind of providing. And let's see if anybody has been, oh, we're really close to the end of the time. Was there anything else in here, um, Drea or Ivy, that you wanted to make sure we, we brought up before we wrap up things for today? Um, I yeah. would... I just want to suggest that we maybe go ahead and and wrap up to give anybody any critical details 
um, for anybody who does want to leave right at 315. Um, but we do have a little bit of wiggle room um, if anybody wants to stay longer um, and ask the panelists more questions. Um, of course, panelists, you're welcome to leave if you have another uh, obligation. Uh, but I just want to mention that we have some flexibility there. But you want to do just a little bit of closing so uh, we have those details? Yeah, that would be great. And I do think we have a, um, I don't know if it was dropped in the chat yet or not. Um, we have, uh, if, if this is, if you would like to continue these types of conversations and be involved in any future um, speaker series about food businesses in, in the region, um, we do have a, a link that I don't know if it was shared in the chat yet or not, but um, if it's not, we can drop it in there before you, you jump off. Yeah, since we are out of time, I would love to just give the panelists um, a chance to have kind of their closing remarks. I apologize, we had so many questions that we didn't that we didn't get to, but just want to remind people we are planning to do more speaker series like these and kind of deep diving into the issues like building our own food system workforce, infrastructure that's needed, and hoping to collaborate with Humboldt, Del Norte, Mendocino so that we can do more of these regional uh, discussions. Um, so look forward to that and add um, your contact to the forum and just give everyone a, a minute or so. If you got a bunch of questions from us, is there something you were really hoping you wanted to share with um, the audience today, um, go ahead and, and have your closing remarks. I'll just say that I think I, I like that Christine brought up the food hub. Um, there, Mendocino or Men, there's the Mendo Lake Food Hub um, that is a nonprofit organization that's been tremendously helpful for us. It's one of the main ways that we get our product to people and in people's hands. And I just think kind of those step and I. I think there are challenges there. For example, right now our food hub doesn't do any um, like meat because they don't have freezers, for example, but I think that's something they're working on. So I just, I think my final closing comment would just be the importance of distribution. And I think looking for avenues that we can work together to distribute, because I think that's one of the sources of inefficiency in local food systems. So that's something I've been really thankful to have access to and also excited about future potential there too. Yeah, it seems like there are so many conversations in regards to that. And, you know, being on the chamber in Eureka, we've had some breakout groups talking about that distribution and collaboration of distribution, like how many trucks are leaving the county full and coming back empty. And of course, that doesn't make sense on any level. But then again, you know, who is going to be the person or group that can help with that organization? Um, so, you know, we are, we are behind that redwood curtain, right? So there's not like a big bunch of people who are trying to get to us, you know, but we want to get out to everybody else. So the empty truck one way or another is, is, is a challenge. Um, you know, let's hope that we all just keep working together and find some answers to those challenges. Um, kind of going along with the, the food hub, um, our commercial fishing industry, uh, one of our biggest um, hardships uh, is the lack of a facility to process in to market our catch. Um, this is huge. We have over 100 and 130, over 130 boats commercially um, throughout Humboldt County alone, and um, nobody really has a, a facility. Um, we were so fortunate to to have been able to merge with Captain Zach's in McKinleyville. Um, but I know that my fleet out there, they don't really have a place to process their fish. So they're only they're limited um, in ways that they can market their catch um, off of their boats, uh, which is a, a, its own beautiful thing to go down to the dockside and um, purchase your fish from your captain and their crew and their families and get to know them face to face. Um, but it really um, limits everybody to what they can do. Um, here, we're able to provide a whole different a range of products um, uh, and refrigeration and freezing. Um, we also make our own ice, and that's something that a lot of our, our, um, our friends on the fleet, they can't do. So 
advocating for some form of dockside market um, processing facility um, would be really, really helpful in our community and our existing fishing businesses. Thank you for that. Any other closing remarks? Well, we can't thank you all enough um, for being here today. Um, this was really a great discussion. Um, we were really looking forward to this. Um, there's, there's a lot to think about um, from here going forward. Um, and we wanna thank everybody in the audience also as well for being able to join us here today. Is there any other closing remarks that either Ivy or Drea would like to make before we, we wrap up and close out the session? Uh, I just wanna thank everybody for being here today. Uh, I really learned a lot from all of you and I hope that everything that we've learned today is really gonna open up some new networking opportunities and a better understanding of the needs and opportunities in our community. Um, I saw a lot of great questions in the chat. I think a lot of people are, are interested. So uh, look out for fellow participants to be reaching out to you all um, and hopefully we can get some things moving. Yeah, I, I agree with Ivy and May. This was a great discussion and I hope it's just the beginning of many more. It's exciting to see um, so many different people coming together and having shared challenges and barriers and also overcoming them and willing to work together. Um, for Ivy, I will help promote um, if there are any new farm businesses out there or existing farm businesses, um, the SBDC will be running a farm business program this winter. So go to SBDC backslash farm. I think it's in the, the chat, but um, there are going to be some business classes and support and we'll have hopefully be reaching out to these panelists to come and give some workshops um, and some expertise to some of our beginning farmers and the new people coming up in the food and farm business. All right, well, thank you everyone and hope to see you again soon. <laughs>